Well, thanks everyone for coming out on a snowy uh, Tuesday uh, and uh, joining us for what uh, we already know is going to be a fascinating panel on the importance of economic diplomacy uh, for uh, American prosperity. Uh, Ambassador Barbara Stevenson, president of the American Foreign Service Association, uh, is going to be uh, moderating the panel discussion and she'll introduce the panelists, but for now, could you please put your cell phones on vibrate or stone? Uh, or whatever silences uh, any other noises. And please be aware that we will be uh, taping this for future use, uh, so you may be seeing yourselves on the website. Uh, and then um, finally, the way this will go is uh, after uh, th about three rounds of questions with the panel, there will be an opportunity for audience Q&A. So with that, let me turn it over to President of AFSA, Ambassador Barbara Steele. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. So welcome, everyone, to um, AFSA, um, to our headquarters. And it's a discussion with three distinguished former senior foreign service officers, and they're going to be talking about the importance of economic diplomacy. So I want to just thank everybody for being here today. Um, I know it's easy to get discouraged we're in the middle, when we're in the middle of the longest government shutdown in history. AFSA decided to go ahead with this event because it highlights the critical work that we do as members of the Foreign Service to keep our country safe and prosperous. Um, it's one of the most effective ways to demonstrate why our work matters and why this shutdown needs to end. America's rivals and adversaries are not furloughed, and we shouldn't be either. Let me draw your attention to the latest copy of the Foreign Service Journal, which is in your seats. It's devoted to our topic, Economic Diplomacy Works. It's the largest edition that we've ever done, and it's mainly um, from members, really. Um, uh, Ambassador Tony Wayne, who is here with us, AFSA's treasurer, did the lead-in piece. Sean Donnelly, another legend of the economic cone, wrote for it, as did Charlie Reese, and we collected stories from the field, and we've shared this all over Capitol Hill. It is a great, inspiring collection. I hope you'll all read it. Um, we've also put in your seats this a little announcement about American Diplomat. This is a podcast series. Have any of you listened to it? Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's Ambassador Pete Romero, who used to be the Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere. He's using a grant from the Una Chapman, uh, Una Chapman Cox Foundation to do this series on, on American diplomats. He's doing economic diplomacy works in the series. There's a recent one by Dan Crocker, who is also on the AFSA board. He is the Foreign Commercial Service Vice President. He explains the BUILD Act. It's great, and it's an important new tool that we have. There are two terrific podcasts in there from Laura Lane, a former economic officer in the Foreign Service and now the head of global affairs for UPS, um, explaining how UPS avoids paying bribes by working with the embassy to get um, trade facilitation agreements in so that UPS can deliver all over the world. It's fantastic for making the connection between the framework work we do overseas and jobs at home, which is really the argument that works for us in Congress. When I visit on Capitol Hill, I always underscore with members and staff that prosperity at home depends on support for American businesses overseas, where 95% of the world's potential consumers live. And our companies want that support. They want that support from the embassies. Last October, Secretary Pompeo received a letter, admittedly with a little help from AFSA, that was signed by 96 business associations, ranging from the uh, Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, down to um, all kinds of local associations, the Florida Trucking Association, associations in Utah and Louisiana and Alaska. And they, in the letter, described the work of foreign service officers as instrumental in advancing the interest of American companies around the world. So our businesses want our help. They want an open and fair global economy, a level playing field where they can compete. And polling data consistently shows that nine in 10 Americans support strong US global leadership. But we have serious competition for global economic leadership. China has increased spending on diplomacy since 2013 by 40%. And in some countries, it's reportedly fielding four or five times, uh, four or five diplomats for every one of ours. 
China is gaining commercial, economic, and political ground on one continent after another. And meanwhile, does anybody know what's happened to U.S. spending on core diplomatic capabilities since 2013? Down by one-third. The erosion of America's core diplomatic capability must be reversed to avoid ceding American leadership. A key aspect of restoring U.S. global leadership is to put a full Foreign Service team on the field again. As I tell members of Congress when I get meetings to build bipartisan support for the Foreign Service, the Foreign Service is first of all readily available. We have mid-level officers who are here domestically looking to get off the bench and onto second base and shortstop, put them to work. We have so few economic officers overseas now, and I'm happy to give you guys numbers, but they're hard to follow when I do a lot. If we were to shift just 150 mid-level positions overseas, we would dramatically increase our position. Thank you for the head nods. All of you who have run overstretched sections and tried to decide which of the following top priorities am I going to do and which am I going to have to ignore. Well done. We're cost effective. The price tag for putting 50, uh, 150 mid-level officers overseas it is under $50 million, which happens to be in the FY19 version, Senate version of our funding bill. It's in the overseas su support cost line. I'm happy to compare that with costs for other items. I won't go into it now. We're backed by business. As I mentioned, businesses are writing in to say we need the Foreign Service. And it's also um, fully aligned with Secretary Pompeo's vision. I don't know how many of you were there when Secretary Pompeo walked into C Street, but he said it was his humble noble undertaking to get America's diplomatic corps in every stretch, every corner of the globe. He has backed a field forward approach to which I just say a hearty amen, let us get out there and do it, sir. How soon can we get on the field? So joining me to discuss these issues is a distinguished panel of retired senior foreign service officers. Um, the first is my dear friend, um, Ambassador Stuart Jones. Stu is now Bechtel's President for Regions and Corporate Relations. He left the Foreign Service in 2017 after a 30-year career. He served as Ambassador uh, to Iraq 2014 to 16, Jordan 2011 to 14, and as Acting Assistant Secretary for NEA from 16 to 17. Welcome, Stu. Ambassador John Byerly was a career Foreign Service officer for more than 30 years. He focused on Central and Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, and Russia, and served as ambassador to Russia from 2008 to 12. He is currently chairman of the board of the U.S.-Russia Foundation. Welcome, Ambassador Byerly. And my dear friend also, Virginia Bennett, who just joined the Center for Naval Analysis as senior director for international programs. Before retiring in 2017, Virginia was Acting Assistant Secretary for DRL, and she previously served as the Deputy Chief of Mission in uh, the U.S. Embassy in Athens. A senior economic officer, she wrote a column about improving the economic cone career track, and it appears in the current issue of the Foreign Service Journal. So rather than standard opening statements, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to answer some questions about challenges to global leadership and economic diplomacy. So let's welcome our panelists with a round of applause, and we'll get started. So Ambassador Jones, you have recently pivoted from the State Department to the private sector. From the Bechtel perspective, how does it look currently for U.S. businesses trying to compete overseas? Thanks, Barbara. Well, first of all, let me say thanks for those ex excellent remarks and for your uh, kind introduction. And I'm just really deeply honored to be on this panel with two outstanding colleagues uh, who I've known for many years. And also delighted to be with this group, and I see many friendly faces in the crowd. So thanks all for coming out. Um, so it's been really uh, quite an interesting transition going from the State Department to Bechtel, as you can imagine, and it's a big, uh, uh, a big adjustment. But it has been very interesting to see the way that um, government um, looks at the international competition. And I think the most important thing, uh, you know, it's what, uh, what Acting Secretary Shanahan said on, um, on his first day on the job is China, China, China. Uh, in the engineering, construction, and infrastructure business, uh, Bechtel faces very, very intense competition from China in all of our international markets. Um, if you uh, 
I, I, probably there are not many subscribers in this room to Engineering Digest, but um, <laughs> it, they have this very interesting um, survey that they do every year, and they list the top uh, 250 uh, engineering and construction firms in the world. And in 2008, there were no Chinese firms in the top wow. 10. Wow. And today, and I just, I just checked this the other day, in 2018, there are eight Chinese firms in the, the top 10. And Bechtel, which had always been in the top 10, has now been displaced to number 12. So this is the level of competition that we are seeing. And of course, all of these Chinese firms are state firms or parastatal firms. They have tremendous support from their government. Um, there's almost no limit to the level of uh, financing that they have access to. And that's not the case for U.S. firms. So uh, during the time, I mean, really for the last two years, uh, Exim Bank has been moribund. So every OECD country in the world, except the United States, has export finance apparatus. Um, the United States does not have that. So Bechtel has been forced to resort to export financing from other countries. So uh, we, we're working now on a motorway in Kenya, and we're going to go to the UK Export Finance Agency to finance that. And you know what that means. That means that we are going to source the materials, services, and, uh, and other things that we can out of the United Kingdom, not the United States. So that's business that the United States is losing right there. I'll, let me, I don't want to go, I don't, don't let me rant. So uh, uh, <laughs> I, I know people want to hear from Craig. <laughs> yeah. That was excellent. Ambassador Byerly, could you talk about how economic diplomacy levels the playing field and enables American businesses to establish themselves? Sure. Uh, first, let me join Stu in thanking you and APSA for kind of shining a spotlight <laughs> on this issue. Uh, you know, I, I really feel a little bit um, uh, humbled and it's kind of daunting to be asked to talk about commercial diplomacy when I, when I look out and I see uh, Tony <laughs> Wayne in the audience, I feel like, uh, mm. you know, uh, an adjunct professor at Princeton in 1930 who's <laughs> giving a lecture on quantum physics or trying to and looks out and sees Albert Einstein yeah. sort of <laughs> smiling at him, you know, so. Um, there is a lot <laughs> that, uh, that uh, embassies, ambassadors, commercial officers, econ officers can do to level the playing field, to give American businesses, American investors a clean shot. That is as true now as it was 20 years ago when I you know, first reached the levels in my career when I got engaged with uh, that uh, back in when I was uh, econ commercial, uh, econ political officer in Prague. But, but let me give you one example. Uh, and it's not about China. I agree with Stu. Uh, China is uh, the gorilla in the room, but we have a lot of businesses in a lot of small countries around the world which are also facing adversity when they try to bid on tenders. When I got to uh, Bulgaria as ambassador uh, in 2005, I, I want to mention that I was also ambassador in Bulgaria. I'm always keeping up with Stu, uh, and he, his two ambassadorships were mentioned, so I want my second yeah. one mentioned too. Uh, but that was my first time as an ambassador. And the second day that I was in my office, I was paid a visit by a guy named David Varod, who was the head of an American film company called, production company called New Image. They had bid on the Bulgarian state film entity, which was being privatized. They'd put in a very good, solid offer. They knew that their offer was superior to the other ones that had been put in by a lot of insiders uh, in the Bul inside and outside the Bulgarian government. And basically, he said, we're getting screwed. Uh, we'd had a period of about five, six months without an ambassador at post. And I met with my team. I didn't have a commercial officer. I had an econ officer, and I had a phone line back to the commercial officers that I'd worked with in Moscow when I was DCM. Uh, and I said, what do we do? How do we do this? And the advice that I got from everybody, including uh, very fair-minded Bulgarians, was make a statement right out of the blocks. Make it clear that the U.S. Embassy, you as the new U.S. Ambassador, 
isn't going to tolerate anything but fair chances and fair access for American companies. So I did that publicly in speeches, but more importantly, I did it privately. And when you're the ambassador in a small country, you can meet with the prime minister. The president's happy to see you, especially in your first 100 days. And I just put it on the table and said, you know, this is kind of a, a chance for you to show your true colors. You're in NATO, you want to get into the EU, and we're prepared to help you, but you've got to help us and you've got to show your bona fides. Just the engagement of the embassy and the ambassador at that level drives the bad actors back. I mean, it's like uh, in the time machine, you turn off the lights and the Morlocks come out, you know, and, they're and you turn on the light and they run back. And we won in the end. It took us about six months, but New Image got the tender. It is now running the film studio in Bulgaria, New Bayana, making feature films. You've watched many of them. You don't even know that they were filmed in Bulgaria. But that was a big win. And more importantly, it had a knock-on effect for uh, all the time that I was ambassador and probably afterwards. You have to keep recharging the battery. You have to go back and make make clear that what you started out uh, with as your main um, insistences are still valid. Uh, but you make it very clear that there's only one way you're going to do business, and they need to understand that if they want to have a good relationship with the United States. And the leverage that we still have, thank God, inshallah, is that most countries do want to have a good relationship with us. How were you, Ambassador Byerly, um, how was your commercial and econ team staffed? Well, uh, in uh, Moscow, we had a full team. We had a commercial counselor, John McCaslin. He had a staff of uh, five Americans and probably 15 Russian nationals. Uh, we had a full econ section, which had probably uh, a counselor and seven officers. So in Moscow, when we decided that we were going to make a, a priority of helping the Russians get into the WTO, this was during the reset under Obama, we made it very clear that the quid pro quo for that, for helping the, uh, the uh, Russians finally get into the WTO after almost 15 years of trying, was we needed to see American companies uh, advantaged, not just a level playing field, but in this case, we wanted a bit of a boost, and w I sat down with uh, the commercial with John McCaslin, and we worked out a strategy. I mean, I've got it. I actually printed it out here. Uh, for three years, we worked off of this strategy that, that John and his team put together uh, uh, on a number of fronts, uh, where what the objective was, what USG action was needed, what the milestones would be. Uh, how hard we needed to work to get Washington involved, which codels were coming that we could leverage. You're from, uh, you represent the Seattle area. Well, Boeing is trying to increase the number of planes it sells to Aeroflot. Can you help us on that? You, you can't do this ad hoc. You really, especially in a country like Russia, you need to have a plan and you need to stick with it. I was just lucky to have a fantastic team and also, frankly, to be there at a time when U.S.-Russia relations we're on an upswing. And when that sun starts shining, you make hay as fast as you can because you can always see on the horizon the storm clouds. Thank you. Virginia, you were DCM in Greece from 2011 to 14 when that country's economy was collapsing and threatening the stability of the European Union. What was Embassy Athens able to do and not do given the team that you had on the ground? Well, first, let me join my other former colleagues in saying it's delightful to be here. I love to look out and see some familiar faces from prior incarnations. Um, so thank you for that. I think you're going to hear many of the same themes come up as we go through this, because just listening to both Stu and John, there's this sense that um, what we can do is being so dramatically um, constrained right now just because of resources and competition that is out there. But looking first at Greece, you know, Greece sits on Europe's southern border. Um, it's actually, um, you know, the host to a NATO port, which is the only place in 
the Mediterranean where you can pull a, an aircraft carrier alongside, port side. Um, you know the Eastern Mediterranean is not the greatest neighborhood, so that actually has some real implications for us in terms of security and stability operations. Um, the Eurozone in 2018 was the United States' largest bilateral trading partner, 670, I think, billion. Canada, 520. Mexico, 511. China, 549, although radically more imbalanced than the Eurozone. Um, you know, when we were in Athens, I think that we, against this spectacular flame out of their economy, GDP contracted by 27% um, during the three years that I was there, although I don't think I was personally responsible. <laughs> um, you know, we saw very, very clearly just how intertwined um, politics and the economy, the social uh, sort of health, the social fabric, how education and innovation, all of these things kind of come together. You can't kind of bifurcate off the economy from every other element in in society. Um, you know, even though we've focused extensively on economic issues, whether it was from endless meetings, frankly, with bankers, commercial and central bank authorities and otherwise, um, you know, looking to stimulate foreign direct investment, um, trying to constrain or at least moderate Greece's outreach to Iran in, you know, quest for lucrative um, trade relationships. Um, we focused a lot on reforming the structural impediments to economic growth in Greece. You know, while we were there, I think in my last year in Athens, we hosted the Treasury Secretary, the Commerce Secretary, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Um, we arranged two White House visits for the Prime Minister. I mean, we did all of the things diplomatically that one does to encourage and support the kinds of reforms that we hope to see to, to preserve the economic, um, you know, relationship that the United States have with the Eurozone. Um, we also, because we knew a lot about the health or relative lack thereof of the Greek commercial banking system, you know, spent an afternoon measuring the safes in, you know, our financial management office um, because we needed to make sure that we had cash delivered to make payroll for our local staff. Um, that actually proved to be quite, you know, I, I sort of was humbled a couple of years <laughs> later when the banks actually did go belly up first in Cyprus when we literally ferried cash in a backpack to Cyprus so that, you know, our embassy there could make local payroll um, and then so that we could make local payroll when the banks did shut down in Greece about a year and a half after I left. Um, again, I take no responsibility for that. Um, but. You know, I'll tell you what we didn't do. We didn't focus on the fact that Costco, China's overseas shipping corporation, privatized 51% of the Port of Piraeus. They were remarkably successful. It's not like we didn't notice. You know, it was kind of, we saw it. But we had no bandwidth with our modest handful of econ officers to really focus on that. And I have to tell you, you know, the. From the vantage point of what are we, six years now since I, five years since I left Greece, honestly, that might have been the most impactful development that we should have been haranguing US policymakers about. Um, you know, what it means is that that opened a corridor for exports from Asia all the way up into Europe through the Balkans into Northern Europe without having to go all the way around a really long border into Rotterdam. So, you know, this had, has a real economic impact on U.S. manufacturers who are overseas, and it also has opened an enormous gateway for our competitors to flood a traditional U.S. kind of market in a way that, you know, we just didn't have the bandwidth to focus on at all. Um, so let me stop there, and then we'll kind of Do round take two, it away yeah. later. Do round Thank two. Thank you. So, Stu, you're in the private sector, and we can see from this conversation here that we're not necessarily winning this game right now. Um, what does the U.S. government need to do to get the U.S. back in the economic diplomacy game? 
Um, great question, and I think Virginia just answered part of it. I think your example of the Piraeus port is a great example. I mean, uh, you know, we were uh, in a situation in Greece, perhaps, uh, you know better than me, where we were focused on the crisis and how is this all going to work in the EU, and, uh, and the Chinese are sitting there and saying, hey, this is, there's a cheap port for sale here. And that's got to be the mentality of our uh, embassies. That's got to be the, um, uh, the mentality of our policymakers. And that's got to be the mentality of our business community. And that mentality has to come together. Um, and that's one, again, I mean, give the Chinese credit. They've, they've figured this out, right? I mean, they are not only seeing these opportunities, but they're coming in with the needed financing and the needed political support to get this done. And another great point in, I think, Virginia's example is, you know, once they control that port, that's not coming back to us in our lifetime, right? So it's the old line, you know, these jobs are going, boys, and they're not coming back. Well, these ports, these infrastructure installations, these power plants, once they become built by the Chinese, that's a Chinese product that is going to be maintained by the Chinese, and that's like, you know, it's like the, the, the razor blade, you know. I mean, they've got the shaver, and the company's going to keep, uh, the country's going to have to keep buying the, the blade from the Chinese, not from the United States. So, um, so I think changing that mentality is essential. And then, sorry to beat a, uh, the drum, but again, Exim Bank is absolutely essential to restoring American competitiveness internationally. Again, we're the only OECD country without an active export finance uh, capability. Um, we could talk about the Build Act. I think the Build Act is well-intentioned. It's nice to see a bipartisan legislation. But really, the Build Act is a very modest measure. Uh, they're talking about $60 billion. That's how much the Chinese have already dedicated to Africa, Africa alone. Um, you look at the Build Act, they're capped at $500 million investments. You know, the Chinese are not capped at $500 million. They're not capped at a billion. They're not capped at two billion. So if we're going to compete in this region, and, and, you know, and I'm obviously focused on the infrastructure, but this is going, I mean, we're all seeing the headlines about Huawei. And I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, so apologies. Uh, but, you know, this is going on in areas where the United States has traditionally led, like in telecommunications yeah. and yeah. communications yeah. apparatuses and things like this. So um, I think, you know, what we need to do is take the momentum of the BUILD Act and expand it by about 100 times. Why, what do U.S. companies bring to the game? Why should somebody prefer us? That's a, a really great question. I think it's not, um, it, it's, it's not talked about enough, but we should talk about it more. And I, I think that this administration and Secretary Pompeo have the right um, outlook on supporting American businesses, but I think that he missed a big opportunity this week in Cairo when he talked about the United States' role in the Middle East, and he didn't talk about American business, and he didn't talk about promoting U.S. business values, U.S. innovation, U.S. technologies. You know, uh, you and I have talked about this before, but, you know, U.S. business represents a powerful component of U.S. soft power. You know that when American businesses come into a competition, they're not going to be cheating. They can't possibly cheat, you know, um, because of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So, you know, I used to always, I had this line in Iraq, they didn't really like it, I said, you know, you know, trout, you know, you know, you see trout in a stream, you know it's a clean stream. You see American businesses uh, in a tender, you know it's going to be a clean tender. And if American business wins, you know it was a clean process. And, and the opposite is also true. Uh, so um, that's part of our American soft power, that's part of our uh, total value package as a U.S., uh, in, in terms of the U.S. bilateral partnership, I think. Brilliant. I love the trout and the clean stream. John, this same question to you. How does the U.S. get back into a winning position in this game? Well, we, I mean, we've talked about a few things that are uh, important. I mean, obviously, I mean, we talked about the BUILD Act and how insufficient it is. And the BUILD Act does nothing at all to address the shortfall that uh, the Foreign Commercial Service, Foreign Agricultural Service has been facing in budgetary terms for the last five years. Foreign Commercial Service is part of uh, ITA in uh, Department of Commerce. Uh, it's got an annual budget of about uh, 400 million. That's for 2,000 employees and 1,500 of those employees are overseas. So we know how much it costs to staff offices overseas. Uh, it's extremely expensive. 
They've got uh, 240 U.S. commercial officers overseas, and that number has basically been flat for the last 10 years. So, you know, in terms of inflation, in terms of the rise of other competitors, we're not keeping pace at all. Um, one of the things that I tried to do every time we had a CODEL, every time we had a high-level visit, was make sure the commercial people were in the room for the country team briefing so that they could talk not only about what they were doing, but the opportunity cost, what, they were mi what we were missing by the fact that they were, I thought, criminally underfunded. So that's one thing that's, that's pretty obvious. There's another thing that, um, that uh, is maybe not so obvious, but it's very important, and it's a big problem we have. Uh, we talked about gaps uh, at lower levels in econ sections okay. in foreign commercial service. We have too many gaps in ambassadorial positions, mm. as we know, overseas. And the Brookings Institution did a study two years ago where they looked at countries in which there was not a resident American ambassador, where our embassy was undergoing a vacancy. And we know some of these vacancies can go on for years. And what they found was, not surprisingly, that companies which would in normal times go to the U.S. ambassador for some political clout to help them resolve a dispute were forced to throw themselves on the mercy of the local country legal system. And this tends to happen Again, no surprise in countries with a very weak rule of law. So when we don't have a U.S. ambassador at an embassy for a year, or I just talked about the six months that we had a gap in Bulgaria when uh, the Morlocks came out. Mm. Uh, when we have uh, gaps, vacancies for two years, we're disadvantaging American companies ab initio, and that's a crime. Thank you, John. I'm glad you mentioned the number of foreign commercial service officers. When I tell people when we're discussing this in Washington that there are exactly there are 250 foreign commercial service officers, they go, in Europe? And you say, no, <laughs> worldwide. That's the total set. And there's even fewer foreign agricultural service officers. There's about 165. These are tiny, tiny numbers. And I find that it, it's an important thing for us in the Foreign Service to know what they are, to put those on the table, because it's a really small group of people that you're asking to do a lot. Virginia, you've written in this month's Foreign Service Journal about the allocation of states' economic officers, mm -hmm. about how that's not keeping up with the reality of our national interests. What does the Foreign Service need to do uh, with its most important resource, its people, to get the U.S. back into a winning position? You know, I think I would go back to you know, the inextricable linkage between, you know, sort of prosperity and stability. It is in the United States' long-term interests not to have a chaotic, unstable world, right? I mean, we like security. We like stability. We like prosperity. You cannot bifurcate the economy from politics. I mean, you know, maybe, like, if you even look at home, you know, the way you impact U.S., you know, the U.S. economy um, with our work overseas is very, very real. But what is prosperity? It's education policy, it's tax policy, it's a whole lot of other different things, um, health care, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think you can separate security from prosperity. And I have long wondered, you know, we have, uh, you know, long had Iran Middle East watchers in you know, key European capitals. I have no idea why we don't have China watchers in a lot of these places. Um, I generally feel like, I, I can remember talking to a former uh, Greek interlocutor who was telling me about all of the U.S. banks who had invested in Greek commercial banks, you know, high risk equals high return, um, they were riveted by what was happening in a snap election because it really was going to determine the fate of their investments, which determined whether or not they were going to keep people on staff at their bank in Boston. You know, so it kind of comes home very cleanly, I think, when you look at those granular examples. I will come back to, you know, one of the countries mentioned, I'll protect the innocent, 85 Americans at a particular post. I was caught up yesterday with a former colleague who is the current chief of mission there. I'll protect the innocent. Big commercial sale pending parliamentary approval um, uh, this week, which is why I'm protecting the innocent. 
No actual econ officer at that embassy. There's one who is the deputy in the combined Paul Econ section, which if you actually read my article, I do set out you know, kind of some of the favorable elements to that because it provides some management experience. No single one of those 85 Americans sitting in a capital is engaged in this, and yet you're talking about 4,000 U.S. jobs riding on that sale. I think that that's wrong, and there certainly is no commercial officer, but I, that's a big problem, I think. Thank you. Round three. <laughs> some final round of questions for our panel, and then we're going to go to questions from the audience. So I hope you've taken some notes and got good questions getting teed up. Stu, I think we've been working together for almost three decades. We started out in the, uh, during the war together in El Salvador. During that time that I've known you, you've always prioritized working with U.S. companies. Um, I want you to talk about that, about why that's been your priority, and also to offer your advice to current economic officers, DCMs, and chiefs of mission. Um, thanks. Well, I think the best advice I think we already got from Ambassador Byerly, which is, to have a commercial strategy. And I think one of the things, the, you know, the planning sort of calendar in the embassy uh, should always incorporate, how, you know, what are our commercial objectives? How are we going to help these U.S. firms? And, you know, um, and how are we, you know, who's going to do it and who's going to do what when? And uh, I think, you know, having a very nice integrated strategy like Ambassador Barley uh, outlined is is really very useful, yeah. and it's going to be different in every embri every embassy, obviously, because not every embassy has a commercial section and other things. But I think setting goals is really important. Uh, two, um, I think um, again, I mean, one of the the re as a, as ambassador, um, the reason I wanted to be a resource for U.S. Um, companies, and I also wanted to be a resource for. Uh, foreign companies who want to do business in the in the United States is because, of course, the the primary objective is to help uh, improve people's lives in the United States, right? As U.S. diplomats, that's our primary objective. We're supposed to be helping Americans and helping improve their lives. So if we can help sell U.S. goods or services in the country we're serving in, we're improving people's lives. That's the primary objective, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but trade, you know, lifts all boats, and uh, you can't have, you know. If you create trade one way, you're going to be able to create trade both ways. And I had the advantage of serving at the embassy in Amman, and we had a free trade agreement. So it was, as a matter of policy, we were, we were promoting not only U.S. goods and services, but also helping Jordanians promote goods and services back. And that, again, was improving lives in Jordan, and that was a positive thing. But what I really recognized was that being involved in this was a tremendous public diplomacy um, benefit that you know you we had this great uh, Facebook page that they I didn't know anything about uh, uh, social media of course but I was educated by the young staff and we had this Facebook page and then we said if we're gonna do it we got to do it big and we had a million followers and you know we would put uh, something that we were doing on the commercial side on the Facebook page and you saw the hits that we would get you saw the positive response people like it people knew that this was creating prosperity in Jordan and in other places and so I think that in addition to the practical commercial benefits, you're getting a genuine public diplomacy benefit. And that's what I was talking about earlier is the soft power of the United States. You know, maybe in, my, in the part of the world where I served, people uh, are tired of the United States talking about democracy and, you know, human rights. And those are important messages. But, you know, frankly, um, you know, the we have to think about how to present those messages to that audience. But they're not tired of hearing about U.S. technology, U.S. innovation, U.S. investment, U.S. job creation, uh, the U.S. style of doing business, which I referred to earlier. But, you know, when you get a U.S. company coming into your country, you know it's going to create in-country value. We don't, we're not like the Chinese. We don't bring all of our workforce into that country. You know, Greg Delaware was a tremendous ally for Bechtel in the motorways that we've built in Kosovo. And he knows that 70% of the amount of money that Kosovo spent on that motorway stayed in Kosovo. And that's a, a really good public diplomacy message, you know, and to the extent that we can foster that, that's going to improve our, our relations around the world. 
I love that. I am such a believer that a big part of where our soft power comes from is the admiration that the host country has for what they see in American companies, whether it's the Marriott Corporation hiring people on merit, training them and promoting them, regardless of their last name and family connections, watching companies like Bechtel and CH2M Hill just solve complex problems and manage complex projects in a way that people go, gosh, only the Americans could do that. Thank you for that, Stu. I absolutely loved it. John, what did you find when you were in Russia about the presence of American businesses? How did they affect the ecosystem there? And then I want you to talk about that, but I also want you to give some of your advice uh, to um, econ officers, DCMs, and chiefs of mission. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I, I really envy uh, people like Stu in Virginia who, you know, and you who served on many different continents in your career. You know, my Foreign Service career spanned the globe from Prague to Moscow <laughs> and, and, every, and every place in between. <laughs> but what that did was, you know, over 20, 30 years, it really allowed me, because I was there at a lucky time when things changed, to see what happened when the Soviet Union fell apart, when Eastern Europe became free and independent. And uh, as much as I can point to the USAID programs that we did and uh, just a lot of the diplomacy of the State Department in helping these countries sort of uh, figure out how to navigate uh, these changes, totally uncharted territory for them, I have to say that most of the positive change that I saw in Russia and in the countries of Eastern Europe resulted from the influence and the demonstration effect of American companies. Uh, and those things have lasted. The culture, corporate culture, standards, practices. Uh, Russia, soon after the collapse of the Soviet Union, had a lot of companies that wanted to do uh, charitable things. So they ended up uh, sponsoring tennis matches, mostly. Uh, American companies came in and said, no, 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 here's how you do it. Where are your factories? What do you know about the communities? Uh, and a lot of this just sank in very, very quickly. Uh, it was remarkable to see this. And what's happened now, it's kind of interesting to see, as the pendulum now has swung back, unfortunately, and the forces that don't favor transparency, don't favor openness, don't really want to care about the local communities, uh, they're now fighting against Russians who understand the way the world works and, more importantly, understand how businesses help their bottom lines. And there's a kind of internal debate now that goes on in places like Russia, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, uh, between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. And I'm just very proud of the, the role that American businesses continue to play in influencing that debate. We'll never be on the inside of that debate, but we have a huge stake in how it comes out. Who wins the internal argument in a place like Russia? Uh, and the fact that American businesses, despite all the problems that we have uh, with Russia now, are still in the game, are still welcomed in Russia, and can still have in influence and impact is something that I think we don't uh, value enough. Uh, things like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, Stu was talking about FCPA. Uh, when I first saw that come into Russia, it was amazing to see how Russian businessmen could use that as a shield. Uh, if they were hit up for bribes, they could say, sorry, FCPA, I can't do this anymore, or else mm -hmm. these five consequences will ensue. But then something even more interesting happened. Uh, by the time I left Russia in uh, 2012, I saw Russian businessmen using FCPA as not just as a shield, but as a sword. They would pick out competitors who were playing uh, a fast and loose game in contravention of FCPA rules, and they would use that as a, as a spear to go after these people. Uh, it was remarkable to see, even in a country like Russia in which corruption is endemic, it's the rule, not the exception, uh, how much standards, practices, and international law can actually win the, the argument at the end of the day. So the presence of American businesses fundamentally shifted the ecosystem 
and made it harder for the forces of darkness to thrive and easier for the forces of light. Right, and that's why, I mean, I have to say, uh, I, you know, I understand the, the drive to sanction Russia now because some of Russia's activities over the last five or six years are deserving of the strongest censure internationally that we can muster. But in the process, we can't hurt American businesses because the presence of American companies in Russia uh, of Russian businessmen who are working for American companies in this country uh, gives us uh, a tremendous amount of leverage and strength that, uh, you know, I fear if through sanctions we begin to turn uh, public opinion and certainly political opinion in Russia against the presence of American businesses like Stu was talking about earlier, uh, we're not going to get that back. Uh, we've established a beachhead there, and we can't cede it. Mm. We can't give it up. I hadn't really thought about the overuse of sanctions actually just ends oh, up negating that started. effect. <laughs> yeah, that's really a great. We probably are going to ask you to write about that, John. I'm just warning you. Um, for the Foreign Service Journal, Virginia, over to you. What is your advice to current econ officers, DCMs, ambassadors? Ditto to all of the above, number one, I think, and number two, just, you know, to the extent that all of the Foreign Service leadership, Secretary Pompeo's speech and Cairo notwithstanding, can remind people that why, you know, that, that what they're doing is important at home. It's not just that it is fascinating and endlessly interesting to be in far-flung places and do good work to help a society. I mean, we, we do that partly because, I mean, in general, I'd rather help somebody than not, right? But that's not really why we're doing it. We're doing it because our efforts stimulate and maintain the flow of the vital lifeblood of the U.S. economy and our prosperity and stability. And it really comes down to that. And I think a lot of folks, I'll, I'll go back to my experience um, that I uh, talked about in the Foreign Service Journal in chairing the 02 to 01 Pollen Econ Promotion Panel. Very difficult for people to talk about why what they did mattered. And so I think that having a little bit of mentorship and leadership to help you know, younger, you know, not, I don't mean to be ageist, but less experienced econ officers make that linkage is absolutely critical to help them understand, and I sound like a broken record, how much economic work is intertwined with prosperity and stability and how much that is in the U.S. long-term interest. So I really, you know, I think it, it, it all comes back to that central theme. Well, this One of the things yes, that I would add, uh, to that, because uh, I talk to a lot of uh, junior officer classes and uh, entry-level officer conferences uh, while I was uh, overseas, and the point that I always tried to make, especially to, you know, we've got people kind of a, we're preaching to the choir here, but in talking to uh, young officers or people who even want to join the Foreign Service and say, well, what should I go into? Uh, you know, I go back to my own career and the world that, uh, you know, I sort of specialized in, the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe. Europe. Uh, when I came into the Foreign Service, the hot, sexy, central, center of gravity thing to do was arms control. No question about it. That's where you kind of hitched your wagon to a star and you had a chance to ride it to the top. That's changed completely now. The center of gravity now is international economics and in, again, the part of the world that I specialize in, the economics of energy. So what I have urged mm -hmm. young officers to do is not just become an econ officer, but try to specialize in uh, the economics of energy because if you do that, you're going to be busy for the rest of the 21st century. And if you live that long, probably into the 22nd century. <laughs> Uh, by then, it'll be the energy of water, the uh, economic importance of water, I think. But for now, let's just focus on hydrocarbons. Stu, any final thoughts? So, um, when I joined Bechtel and I started to travel with uh, my new colleagues, many of them much younger than me, young professionals, 
and they were involved in trying to promote job, uh, you know, to promote our projects. And I said to them, you know, what's your experience with the embassies? How do you, you know, how is your interaction with the economic officers? And these would be people who wouldn't necessarily meet with the ambassador, but people who meet with the economic or commercial officers at the working level. And you know, they said these are good people. They're earnest. They want to do the right thing. They don't know very much, and they don't know about our business, and they don't really. Um, have, uh, uh, they can't really steer us in the right direction sometimes. And I think from an economic officer standpoint, I think it's really important to make sure that you're reaching out to the American business community and you're understanding their problems. Um, and of course, you know, uh, probably none of us in this room uh, is going to become an expert on, you know, uh, infrastructure engineering, you know, civil engineering, but I think, um, but the idea is, you know, as generalists, we can learn uh, about a lot of different things and we can start to connect the dots. And I think going back to John's point, again, certainly that's also true in the energy sector. You know, these are hot, these are hot issues, they're important issues, and hanging out with the young and mid-level executives in the energy sector, whether they be Americans or from other countries, I think is a tremendous opportunity to sort of get in and understand what, what they're facing. And then over time, you build those relationships, you build your knowledge base, you can become more effective. And it's fun. Hanging out with American business is some of the best times I've had in the Foreign mm -hmm. Service. I see not, you know, heads nodding. You get to go into a whole area of things. What Bechtel taught me when I was ambassador to Panama, and they were competing on the uh, canal expansion bid about you know, concrete and aggregate and steel and risk and the way that it's dispersed in a contract. It was a fantastic education. It's one of the, and I was a much more effective than advocate for the American team. It's really fun to go into it. I love also what John said about, um, you know, it's not arms control anymore. The big issue is maintaining our global leadership, which is going to have to come with us staying on top here. Um, this is what the new national security strategy says, too, and I just really want to flag that for everybody. I mean, it talks, it moves us from a kind of um, where terrorism is our biggest threat to going back to state actors and focusing on that. And it talks about the need that it's a highly competitive environment and that we have to upgrade our diplomatic capability in order to compete in the current environment. So we're actually operating very much inside of a national security strategy under what Secretary Pompeo said when he walked through the C Street about field forward. Um, we just need to get some more people on the field so that we've got second base and shortstop covered because China's at bat and you know they're just running the bases while we're not out there. So this is why AFSA has been focusing on this for, for a number of months now is to kind of rally the troops and get us focused on the centrality of this mission. And I got to tell you what, folks, there's no better way to bolster bipartisan support for the Foreign Service on the Hill than to focus on our role in keeping um, Americans in jobs and keeping threats at bay and keeping prosperity here at home. So with that little paid message from the President <laughs> of ASA, I'm now going to, um, we're going to have a roving mic and we're going to ask, if you want to ask a question, Alyssa will come to you, just raise your hand. Um, can I get you guys to do a round of applause for this panel, though, before we go to questions? What a great panel. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. OK, Alyssa will look for your hands and then offer you the mic. And if you wouldn't mind introdu in, uh, introducing yourself before your question, we'd be grateful. Does this work? OK. My name is Andy Snow. I'm a recently retired economic officer from state. Thanks to the panel and thanks to AFSA for having this and for your issue all about economic diplomacy. I'd like to ask the panel what, to comment, sort of elevate discussion a little bit and, and comment, why do you think this message isn't getting through more to our political class and specifically Congress, the administration? I mean, when you consider what a powerful constituency the business community is, and you consider that until recently you had the party that is perceived, rightly or wrongly, as being more business friendly, having majorities in both House and Senate, and you have a, the same party in the administration. Why do you think there was this Exim Bank craziness persisted that you mentioned, Ambassador Jones, or that that you know state isn't being funded or ambassadors aren't being put in fields? And this message doesn't seem to resonate with political class, and I'd be interested in your opinion. Thank you. 
Well, I, so on the XM, I would say that, um, you know, I remember being a, a mid-level economic officer and talking to a counterpart at XM uh, back, you know, maybe 15 or 20 years ago and saying, hey, why don't you open a window for small and medium-sized enterprises? Because everybody thinks you only lend your money to Boeing and uh, other major U.S. <coughs> companies. And they said, we're not really interested in doing that. And I think what they're suffering now is a result of, you know, really a, t a ten year politically that they were not being responsive to anybody but the top, you know, the Fortune uh, 100 companies. And that's a shame. And uh, you know, and now it has to be somehow walked back because we really do need XM. Um, the problem is, is that they got this uh, reputation for for corporate for providing corporate welfare, and that really resonated in certain political circles. Um, and, and not without reason. So I think, you know, now this discussion has to be reopened and walked back and, and better understood. And I think the, the constituents of those uh, congressional leaders who have uh, dismantled XM need to be better educated about how it's going to benefit them uh, if XM can be revived. I, I think a, a large part of it uh, traces back to Congress and changes in focus and emphasis in, in Congress. When I was ambassador in Moscow, where's Alexis? Are you still here? What did we have? Uh, four CODELs in the almost, maybe five CODELs in the almost five years, four years that I was in Moscow. Uh, this is ridiculous. Uh, if you don't have congressmen and women out seeing what it is you actually do and talking to the people who benefit from what embassies and commercial services do, talking to the businessmen, the American businessmen in the country, uh, it's out of sight, out of mind. Uh, you cannot make a strong case for this abstractly. You've got to have people walking the ground. And for a lot of reasons that uh, you know, I think are, are pretty sadly clear, uh, there's not much of a premium put on foreign travel now for congressmen. It's a liability yeah. for them. And uh, uh, until we can sort of write that, uh, put that into better balance, I think we're, we're kind of fated to be fighting uphill on this one. Virginia? I think you have to really put it in terms that, you know, are granular and that speak to people. I mean, I was really struck by something that I read in a recent um, Carnegie Endowment report on uh, Ohio and, and sort of perceptions of foreign policy. It just came out. I, I'm sorry, I'm bungling the actual title of it. But you know, Ohio lost massive numbers of manufacturing jobs, average wages, you know, well upwards of $50,000 annually. Those jobs migrated to China and they've been replaced by jobs paying in the 20,000 range at Walmart selling products manufactured largely in China, at least of my recent, you know, well, I don't know, I don't have a Walmart near me, but a Target experience. So you have to find a way to speak to people about why what we are doing matters to them. And it's not often that we get the luxury of working on a big commercial sale that translates into 4,000 jobs. But we are very creative and very thoughtful analysts. And I feel like if we put our minds to it, um, we'll be able to come up with illustrations of why American ingenuity and innovation and endless creativity is so globally admired in the business community. And I think that's what we need to tell people. We need to look at how we have impact in our own communities, wherever you are from. Think about it, you know, I really would encourage that because those are the kinds of, you know, the granular stories are the kind that get through to people. You know, they, they get through to people much more than democracy matters, human rights matters. It's like, yeah, 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 we know we all take it for granted. Um, I shouldn't say that as a former acting assistant <laughs> secretary for <laughs> democracy and human rights, but anyway, y y you gotta marry it up to what really counts at home. Exactly, and I, that's that's been a long-standing challenge in the foreign service. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do it better. And part of this series that we've been working on, economic diplomacy works. It's geared at getting us, the foreign service, to be better at talking to 
the American people and visiting congressional delegations about how our work abroad translates directly into better lives for Americans at home. And then I think you also have to do, I mean, I think that there's a real, for me, that part is the first and most important argument we have to make for visitors. It's also a crucial part of where our soft power comes from. If you're worried about maintaining America's global leadership, you need lots and lots of successful American businesses demonstrating American can do and problem solving in the country where you are because it, nothing makes your job as an American diplomat easier than having all of that to fall back on. Um, the next question, yes. Hi, um, my name is Preeti Shah. I'm a public diplomacy cone officer and I uh, wrote the piece about agriculture and craft beer promotion in this month's uh, journal. Uh, as a public diplomacy officer, I'm interested to hear your insight and advice and best, uh, best stories and anecdotes about how you've leveraged your country team, uh, including political, PD, and other sections to achieve this whole of mission goal in terms of um, promoting US businesses overseas, because it's something we all work on. Um, and I just would love to hear how you found success in using the rest of your staff, the rest of your team, to get us all on the field for the same goal. Fantastic question. Who wants to first go at that? Well, one, one of the things uh, <laughs> that uh, worked for, this is all sort of what worked for me, what worked for us, both in Bulgaria and in Moscow, almost all the posts I was at, were trade missions. Uh, I remember in particular something called DISCUS, the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States, uh, which would come and mount a kind of a mini trade show to show the strength of American agricultural products, which is distilled and bottled. Uh, and that was great when we could invite the hoteliers and uh, the restaurant owners, but it was only really effective when we were able to broadcast that to the country as a whole, especially in a country like Russia, the mm -hmm. size of Russia. Uh, the multiplier effect of having your uh, public affairs people on the country team part of the sort of commercial strategy is really, really important because otherwise you're kind of just talking to a closed room. And the ideas, the creativity, we had some really creative uh, PAOs and, and CAOs uh, in Moscow in particular. Just their ingenuity in uh, figuring out ways to get beyond the walls of the room uh, paid huge dividends. I, I just want to chime in because I'm looking at one of my former crack PD officers from um, Athens. Um, you know, I, I think it is so critical that whatever the public diplomacy section is doing is moving lockstep in support of overall mission goals. And, you know, I will say that you know, again, we're endlessly creative people, right? And sometimes that endless creativity can lead to people kind of going off and doing their own thing because they think it's a great idea. And it might be a great idea, but I think that, you know, no mission has a single goal. Maybe they have three, maybe they have five. Everybody ought to know exactly why what they're doing in public diplomacy supports one of those top two, three, four, five goals. And if there's not an explicit linkage that you can point to, if it's just that it's nice to do, rethink what you're doing and why you're doing it. Stu, I'm going to call on you because we always use you in the ambassadorial seminar as the example of going back to your integrated country strategy before every country team meeting to remind yourself of what you're doing and what everybody's role is. How do you get your whole team behind this? So I actually have to admit, I failed at this. I always had this idea that if you got the right people in the room with the commercial people and the economic people and the public diplomacy people, that we would develop a really good approach. And in the end, it was always sort of ad hoc. And I, like Craig, I mean, like you have a trade mission, that's going to get great, you know, that's going to get great pictures out of it. You get some good content. You get nice hits on the Facebook page. It's great. But how to sort of generate that um, and not be reactive, I, I, I have to say we've never succeeded. And I think this is something we should look at in the department and elsewhere. I think, too, I think one of my frustrations with, um, with our, the overall sort of State Department social media approach is that every post has to develop its own content, its own substance. And why is that? I mean, we're, you know, we've got an integrated, you know, 
uh, commercial strategy throughout the world, why aren't we getting stuff from IIP all the time promoting you know, U.S. companies' compliance with FCPA or U.S. Uh, innovation in the tech sector as, lift, as improving lives in various places? And we should be getting that uh, content out to the uh, you know out to the embassies where they can put it in the American centers and they can put it on their Facebook pages and on their Twitter and other things. But no one ever I, I, I just I was never able to get that going, and it's a source of uh, uh, a great source of uh, guilt for me. I think it might have to do though with with uh, the point that um, John made earlier about when the focal point was sort of arms control or climate change, you got a lot of stuff pushed out. But we've had 12 hearings in Congress since um, the end of March on the rising threat from China and what it means to our global leadership. So this is becoming the preeminent issue. And it's time now to kind of make sure that the oil tanker turns and, and to have this sort of thing. I can just imagine uh, what that uh, piece of material from IAP might look like. You could have a clean trout stream running in the background. There you go. the visual. It'd be mm -hmm. really powerful stuff. <laughs> Next question. Thank you. I'm uh, Mark Wall, retired uh, Foreign Service, uh, uh, largely uh, uh, as an economic officer. Uh, th these excellent comments have tended to focus on what economic officers uh, do in embassies to support uh, uh, U.S. companies. Uh, but there's uh, uh, also a lot that economic officers do uh, where they are kind of at the front line of a broader interagency effort. Not just FAS and FCS, but <coughs> Treasury and USTR and many other economic agencies. Uh, also what they do is not just in embassies, but some of what they do is multilateral. WTO, uh, regional trade agreements, OECD and the like. And, and finally, some of what they do isn't there to support specific U.S. companies, but to deal with some of the policy and regulatory issues inside a, uh, a country uh, which have a big impact on the success of, of U.S. companies. So I wonder if, there, if you might have any comments on this other dimension of what economic work uh, is all about. Who wants to take that first? I don't know how the Brexit vote has gone today, so I'll just say briefly on the Grexit front or the potential for Grexit front from the Athens incarnation. I, I mean, that our econ team was focused absolutely on how to manage and um, respond to and anticipate the prospect for a disorderly departure of Greece from the Eurozone and compliance with their IMF loan programs. And, you know, some of the, um, you know, sort of the, the health of the um, banking sector and sort of the fiscal integrity measures and things like that. I mean, this was long-term big macroeconomics, and it absolutely mattered. There certainly was a multilateral piece to that. That comes in. It's, so it's not just about, you know, again, most of us don't get that big 4,000 job dependent commercial deal to work on. But, you know, what they were focused on mattered absolutely to the United States because if you saw a collapse of, you know, the Eurozone, what was that going to do to our export market? What was that going to do to? what we have seen unfold in the years since, security and stability in many other European states because of refugee crises, et cetera, et cetera. So there are all these bigger factors that econ officers absolutely work on. And I think they do it incredibly well. Um, it's hard to take those big picture things and turn those into granular examples of why it matters. One example where that happens is on this, e on this American Diplomat podcast. Laura Lane, who's with UPS now, she does a great story that goes granular, just like Virginia is talking about. Um, the difficulty for UPS is their goods have to cross borders for them to deliver them. And what happens at many borders in less developed countries? What's <laughs> being asked for? A bribe. a bribe. And can UPS pay the bribe? No. Absolutely not. 
So this would seem to indicate UPS can't operate that way at, in that place. What UPS has done, and they, she talks about this is when we have to work in partnership with the American Embassy to create an enabling framework that allows us to deliver the goods without paying the bribe. And she describes then working with the Embassy in country after country to get the WTO approved trade facilitation agreements in place. And it takes the um, paperwork for bringing your shipment in from 15 people, each of whom is asking for a bribe, to Bitstreams. It's online. And Bitstreams don't take bribes, as Laura says so pithily. And so it's that kind of an enabling framework where we look at why is it American companies cannot compete in the logistics sector here. OK, if we can change the framework, they can. When we met with Business Council for International Understanding as part of this um, initiative, um, a major life insurance company was at the table and talked about being in a southern cone country in the Western Hemisphere and wanting very much to be able to compete in a big bid to um, do the pension fund for the teachers um, in that country. The code, though, did not enable them. It wasn't, they could not compete. So they went to the embassy, explained why they couldn't participate, and the embassy went in and said, you'd like to have a really high quality supplier of annuities for your teachers when they retire. We can get you there if we can work together to clean up your code so that they can compete. They did, they won, and Argentina's teachers now are being paid by a high quality American company and the jobs were kept here. So this is this part about creating the enabling framework. When I first started my career, I was an econ officer in Panama in uh, intellectual property rights. It was we were first starting to talk about them. They were absolutely not being honored in Panama. And we did a lot of work on getting um, the Panamanians uh, in the free zone on the, the Atlantic side to stop. Um, I mean, the minute an American movie would come out, the machines would start going, making bootleg copies, which would be sent all over Latin America. And we took down the video pirate that did that. His name was Mr. Zafrani, and I went dressed as a video pirate for Halloween. I was very involved in my job. So we made some really important strides in getting better intellectual property rights there. I want to tell you a happy story about that. When I went back, it feels like we're imposing our will on Panamanians, right? Making them pay a lot for intellectual property. That's why it's, it's, it's an uncomfortable space to be in sometimes. So when I went back, um, I had a huge party for the Oscars because Panamanians love to dress up and, and do the red carpet. We had Klieg lights and all that. We actually ran a video contest with the community for the best video from Panamanian school kids on why intellectual property rights matter. And they, the kids produced this fantastic video that just showed that their own work as musicians and artists disappearing in the absence of intellectual property rights and that they were glad Panama had them and I was able to give the kids a mini Oscar at the party. And by the time I went back 20 years later as ambassador, Panamanians owned intellectual property rights. This is about protecting my work and my artistic achievement and my intellectual property as well. And a similar thing happened with the banks. When I went there, we would have the bankers over and we would try to talk about money laundering and these would be like banks based in Miami with household names and they would be in the ambassador's house eating his food and drinking his orange juice and saying quite openly, ah, business is business, who cares where this money comes from? I mean, not even paying lip service to the idea that mon laundering drug money was a problem. By the time I went back 20 years later, through the work of the Financial Action Task Force, one recommendation at a time, Panama's banking sector was largely cleaned up. Panama still gets a black eye for the bearer shares issue, but who issues bearer shares, bankers or lawyers? Lawyers. The banking sector is actually appalled at what the lawyers are doing because it continues to give them a black eye. So these framework issues, I have seen them work, but they work only when the American embassy is in there understanding it, understanding how it affects American business, and bringing people along. But it can fundamentally transform a place and make it possible for us to dominate the economy there and do it without ever paying a bribe. And it's about the forces of light versus darkness. Our presence absolutely keeps, who is it at bay? The Morlocks. The Morlocks. The Morlocks. It keeps mm. the Morlocks at bay. Sorry for that. I'm an evangelist about this topic. Next question. <laughs> Makes us the LOE. Hi. Uh, my name is Natalia Mann. I'm a newly minted economic officer of the 196A100 class. 
Uh, <laughs> um, one of the pieces of advice we received several times from many speakers in A100 was know and understand the interagency process. And I wanted to know if you could speak to this either as general advice or through specific examples on how state economic officers can work within that process to further economic diplomacy and our objectives. So abroad, of course, we have the country team, which is really the, I think, the gold standard for interagency cooperation. And you get, it's really easy at a post to get everybody in the room to work together and to recognize shared goals and objectives. It's much more, I think, difficult in Washington. And um, I, again, I think, I, I can't say that I ever succeeded in sort of cracking the code on this. But one thing I think is that's very important is to um, get up from your desk and to uh, get on the metro and go uh, or walk to USTR or walk to Commerce and walk to uh, get to the other offices and meet your counterparts and talk to them about what you're doing and establish rapport and relationships of trust. Um, and I think because to, to the extent that you can replicate the spirit of the country team in Washington, I think you can be more effective. Now, you know, you working at the desk officer level with your commerce uh, counterpart at the desk officer level or USTR counterpart, uh, that doesn't mean that the masters are going to, you know, welcome that cooperation or, or uh, foster it, but you will benefit professionally from that. And the other thing I would say is that as a, 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 an entry level officer, every opportunity you get to get interagency, to go to training sessions where the other agencies are present, uh, not just State Department training, but the kind of training that goes for uh, across the board by other institutions so that you can be sitting with uh, people from Commerce, people from USTR, people from the Pentagon, people from the agency. I think that's tr very, very beneficial. And those contacts are contacts that you can uh, carry with you through your career. Uh, but there's no easy fix to this problem. Um, you know, I think some agencies, uh, and I don't think our agency is exempted, you know, whenever they get something from another agency, the first reaction is uh, skeptical. And, you know, the, that, you know, we, we need to address that in the system to make it more effective. One of the things uh, when I was overseas that I found to be most frustrating uh, was managing the relationship with Washington. It was always a lot harder than managing the relationship with the Russians or the Bulgarians or the Czechs. Uh, and, a, and a lot of that flows from the fact that there's just a lot of stuff going on in this town, in the interagency sphere, that you find out about too late at post. So what I would tell my econ officers and political officers, commercial officers, was find your person back home who is going to let you know, give you a heads up, that there's a meeting scheduled this Friday at which issue X is going to be discussed because you want to have your oar in that water before the meeting is held. After the meeting's held, sometimes, especially if it's a higher level, uh, sort of more classic interagency meeting of the kind, I'm not sure they have very many at the, in this administration, but in any case, uh, by the time those decisions are made in Washington, uh, a lot of times, even if you're the ambassador and send, send back cable, an outraged cable, it's too late. Uh, so your sources of information that, you know, the, the network of friends and colleagues that you build in Washington will really help you be more effective when you're overseas if you can tap into them uh, and invoke the no surprises rule. Virginia, how do you make the interagency magic happen? I think it's first very helpful to understand I mean, we're all working on the same spectrum, right? I mean, we're all working to promote and advance U.S. interests wherever. Um, but we do that on different pieces of the spectrum. So, you know, what an economics officer is doing overseas in terms of reporting back on the general health of the economy and, you know, particular developments and sanctions issues, et cetera, et cetera, you know, that feeds into where commerce is looking for commercial opportunities or where Treasury is looking at foreign direct investment in the United States and the health of our global, you know, monetary supply and, you know, whatever. It, so everybody has a different piece that they're working on. 
And in the perfect world, we're all kind of pulling together. Um, you know, it, it, on the non-economic front, I would just say, if you look at a spectrum from the intelligence communities to the media, you know, we're all dealing in information and presentation of it, but we do it in very different ways and two different audiences. And so I think it's quite analogous. I mean, get to know the other agencies and, and figure out what they care about. Um, One class that FSI offers is um, National Security Executive Leadership Seminar for a little later in your career. It's for sort of GS 14, 15, FS1. And it's a chance to actually, it's a mini version of what the old senior seminar used to be for a slightly earlier phase where you spend a lot of time understanding what other agencies do, but it's always easier to do it at post, and you definitely building up trust um, among and personal relationships is key. Um, Greg. My classmate. 13th class. Greg Delaway. I started off as an econ officer, although I guess it went backwards in John's ter uh, terms because I wound up in kind of an arms control before my last overseas assignment. So <laughs> <laughs> it but never goes away. <laughs> it never goes away. Um, in, uh, in Kosovo, which is a poor uh, developing country, and, and Bechtel was one of our great partners, but we also helped other American businesses, and there's a perfect foreign service story encompassing almost every bit of us uh, related to franchise, restaurant franchise, uh, like McDonald's, et cetera. Uh, we had Kentucky Fried Chicken and we had Domino's. I just started up in the last you know, year I was in Kosovo, and there was a big problem because they have very high standards and only take certain ingredients. And for some reason, the type of flour that KFC wanted for their chicken was not on the phytosanitary list in Kosovo, so they couldn't get it in the country. <laughs> well. Okay, how do you solve this problem? Well, it turns out you use core diplomatic skills. And this kind of gets to your question as well. It turns out the phytosanitary office had of course been set up by USAID uh, years ago. The, uh, the current director had been a, a visitor. International in visitor. IVP mm -hmm. uh, in the United States. And the econ officer and the commercial oh, yeah. FSN were able to draw on these experiences of the other bits of the embassy they had to learn about flour. Uh, this is, you know, but, you know, econ officers can do that type of stuff. They can take something they know nothing about and become an expert in flour in, you know, in a couple of weeks. So we were able to get the um, KFC flour into the country, and there are thriving five restaurants now and in a you know, poor developing country in the Balkans. So, you know, good things can happen with hard work uh, and with a lot of interagency uh, cooperation. But is the flour imported? Yes. Any hope of getting <laughs> the uh, Kosovars to actually grow the kind of wheat that makes the flour that um, passes muster? Eventually. But, you know, KFC. Because that's what they had, that's what M McDonald's did in Russia, right. you know, basically. They grow their own potatoes. They imported. Absolutely. Can you imagine importing potatoes to, to Russia? Russia. <laughs> Probably comes through the Costco side of the Port of Piraeus now. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got two minutes left. I'm going to just do a quick lightning round across the panelists. Any final thoughts? I, I want to come back to Mr. Wall's question because I think it was a really good question about how t t finding the right balance between being involved in sort of multilateral diplomacy, standards, ba uh, standards developing, uh, technical assistance, and sometimes that uh, and then versus or not necessarily versus, as you pointed out, the commercial function. And I think you know, I think you made a really good point. I think when you can see a definitive benefit for U.S. firms or for U.S. policy, that's really worthwhile. Um, but I do think that sometimes the U.S. government becomes more involved in the process and less focused on the outcome. And I've been in conversations where I'm saying, let's, you know, we should really advocate for this U.S. company and someone uh, from the economic or commercial side saying, no, what we really want here is an even playing field. Well, we want an even playing field, as Greg said, after the, we advantage the U.S. companies. Uh, or we want a, a, a level playing field that benefits and advantages U.S. companies. We are not in the business of advantaging companies from other countries. Um, and I think that has to be incorporated into this overall approach. Um, and I think this administration recognizes that. And, um, 
and we should, you know, in that part of this uh, message, I think needs to be very taken very seriously. Uh, very briefly, one of the maxims that I always tried to push uh, throughout my career, but especially when I could started uh, to be able to push things, was uh, called "Please go away," and "Please go away" meant get up get away from your desk. If you're in Washington, get out and see the other agencies. Go up to Capitol Hill. If you're overseas, w what you said, hang out with the business people. Hang out with the people, the economic people, business people at the local universities, uh, and understand better how they see the world. Because the only way to be effective in what we do is to be able to put yourself in the shoes of the other guy. Uh, and understand what it's going to take to win the argument with him. And you can only do that if you go away from your desk as much as possible. Virginia. Ask every single person what they think, you know? I mean, everybody in this room probably has an opinion about the U.S. economy right now, right? So if you ask every taxi driver, every you know, shop clerk, every single person, with whom you interact, not just the government, not just the business community, you know, everybody's got a piece of it. And I think that because the kind of pervasive nature of uh, how the economy impacts individuals, it, you, you gotta talk to as many people as possible to know what's really happening in, quote, the economy. So just interact, interact, interact as Ambassador Barley said, get away from your desk and talk to everybody. I want to thank every one of you for coming. Um, we are going to wrap this up in just a second. And we're going to invite you to stay with us for some food and some conversation. A little notice, the last three rows are going to get of chairs are going to get picked up pretty quickly to make room for you all to gather. So if you wonder what we're doing, we're not running you out. We're trying to create space for you to nosh and, and uh, talk to each other. Um, thank you for great questions, <coughs> for, for great insights. Could I get you guys to join me in a round of applause for our terrific panel? Thank you. Thank you. Russian style. Thank you.